Tom here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York. You gotta start by saying we made a terrible mistake and we paid a hell of a price for it. We can't even get into the cockpit. We don't know who's up there. They told us what they were gonna do. And they told us they want to do it in this country. And nobody put it all together. We have some Everything was okay. I don't understand how our entire government apparatus could have been so asleep at the wheel. 19 people operating on a plot hatched in the remotest parts of Afghanistan beat every single defense that this country has. Seven of the passports were gross forgeries. I think it could have hauled AK-47s on those planes. This was a failure of policy, management, capability, and above all, a failure of imagination. September 11, 2001, millions of Americans from Boston to Washington, D.C., wake up to a brilliant, nearly cloudless morning, the kind of late summer day in New York that suggests tans are fading and autumn is on its way, the kind of day when talk on buses and subways will soon switch from the Yankees and Red Sox to the Giants and Redskins, the kind of day when New York's towering skyscrapers most brilliantly reflect the stark light and high energy of the city. In Washington, Congress will be in session in a few hours. Thousands of federal employees will arrive for work at the Pentagon. In Florida, President Bush takes an early morning run before his visit to a Sarasota classroom. In Lower Manhattan, thousands of New Yorkers make their way to work at the World Trade Center. At the same time, in Portland, Maine, Newark, Boston, and Washington, D.C., 19 men prepare themselves for a final journey, one that would turn this beautiful day to dust and darkness. You gotta start by saying, every single one of us made a huge miscalculation. We made a terrible mistake, and we paid a hell of a price for it. The United States government was simply not active enough in combating the terrorist threat before 9-11. If you read that part of our report, it's hard not to get angry. Angry at the desultory, negligent approach of the bureaucracy responsible for our air travel security. If everybody had been doing their job, then none of them would have got in because at least nine of them had either falsified or improper credentials and forged passports that could have easily been detected. But not one employee at four different airports the hijackers would pass through was looking carefully. At home, we need to set clear priorities for the protection of our infrastructure and the security of our transportation. The checkpoint screening where the uh, hijackers go through the detectors was really the only line of defense we had during 9-11, and it didn't work. 6 a.m., Mohammed Atta and Abdul Aziz al Omari arrive at the airport in Portland, Maine. Atta is picked out by a computerized pre-screening system that identifies passengers who should be scrutinized by special security measures. 
The system, called CAPS, was designed to stop terrorists who checked luggage packed with bombs, but don't board the flights themselves. It's not looking for terrorists on suicide missions. So they looked in their checked baggage. There was nothing there. They said, all right, sir, onto the plane. 6.45 AM, Atta and Al Omari arrive at Boston's Logan Airport. They meet up with the three other members of their team and get ready to board American Flight 11. A second team also gathers at Logan. They are booked on United Flight 175. All 10 pass through security, even though some of them are carrying knives. They were very skillful at exploiting the gaps. Uh, they knew, for example, they could not get a six inch blade knife in, but they could get a four inch blade knife. And so they used that. The very idea that it was permissible for young Arab males to carry four inch knives, which was the principal weapon of choice. We now know we've recovered three of them from the wreckage, that that was perfectly all right. 7.35 AM, hundreds of miles to the Southwest at Washington Dulles Airport. Five more men are proving how easy it is to beat the airport security system. This videotape shows two of the Flight 77 hijackers setting off alarms as they go through the checkpoint. Here, they go through a second time. One of the men sets it off again. Now, a screener wands him. With no questions, he heads to the gate. Even when they went through the magnetometers and were stopped and pulled out for questioning, they still let them go through with the knives. They didn't even bother to look in the ditty bags they were carrying, which now we now know had mace and tear gas, and that is, that's gross negligence. According to the report, an agent at American Airlines' check-in counter finds brothers Nawaf and Salem Al-Hazmi suspicious. One doesn't even have a photo ID, but they are allowed to go through security anyway. Nawaf sets off two metal alarms, but the screener never resolves what set off the alarm. They just walked onto the planes. I mean, those guys, I think they could have hauled AK-47s on those planes. You can get through any of these things if the people on the job don't care, don't have a motivation to do their job. A problem, states the commission, that runs much deeper than airport security. Most of the hijackers shouldn't have gotten into the country. There are the things on the passports or things in the visas that should have required more questioning. Most of the visas that were issued to these people were not even filled out in gross violation of policy. The visa applications, for instance, asked, what is your uh, source of financial support while you're in the country? They put in myself. You're supposed to put the institution when you're on a student visa, where have you been accepted and what is the institution? They've either left it blank or filled out, uh, said things like a school in the West. None of these things were picked up. The commission report states that by 8 a.m. Tuesday morning, the 11th of September, 19 men, many of whom didn't even speak English, had defeated every layer of airport security we had in place to stop hijackings. The chilling part is that Al-Qaeda has gone to school on all of these issues. They understand the vulnerabilities. They, they're very intelligent people. And getting through security is just the beginning of a deadly plot that was years in the making. 7.59 AM, American Airlines Flight 11 takes off from Logan Airport with 81 passengers including five hijackers who have their mission down to a science. They knew what time of day to fly. They knew where to sit. These guys did their homework. They would buy tickets for some of the terrorists that would sit very close to the cockpit, and they would be the initial uh, attackers. The 9-11 Commission believes that two of the hijackers are sitting in the front row of first class. 8.14 AM, when the seatbelt sign is turned off, Wail al Sheri and Walid al Sheri rise from their seats and stab the two first-class flight attendants. There would be another two enforcers, at least two or three, that would sit at the very back of the first-class section to see if anybody went up to fight against the initial attackers. There was one passenger who immediately tried to get up and 
and go to the defense of the flight attendants and the uh, hijacker sitting behind them uh, reached over and cut his throat. According to the report, the terrorists spray mace and pepper spray into the first class cabin, forcing the other flight attendants and passengers into the rear of the plane. Mohammed Atta and another hijacker then push their way into the unlocked cockpit, stabbing the pilot and co-pilot to death. Atta, the only hijacker trained to fly, takes over the pilot's seat and makes an announcement to the passengers. We have some claims, just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. Meanwhile, two flight attendants in coach, Amy Sweeney and Betty Ong, call American Airlines on air phones. Nidia Gonzalez takes the call. The tape of their conversation was played during the 9-11 commission hearings. Somebody stabbed in business class. I think there's mates that we can't breathe. And I don't know. I think we're getting hijacked. Our first class passengers, our uh, first class uh, galley flight attendant and our purser has been stabbed. And we can't get a, the cockpit. The door won't open. Are they taking everyone out of first class? Yeah, she's just saying that they have. We contacted air traffic control. They are going to handle this for the confirmed hijacking. In a very calm, professional, and poised demeanor, Betty Ong relayed to us detailed information of the events unfolding on Flight 11. While Ong and Sweeney stay on the phone to the airline, an air traffic controller in Boston is also aware of the hijacking. Just before 8.25 a.m., over the plane's radio frequency, he hears Atta's voice. Nobody move. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, you'll danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. But they are having trouble locating the plane. That's because the hijackers have turned off the plane's transponder. Once they turned off the so-called trans transponder, which enables them to see where the plane is, it was lost on radar. So the FAA had no idea where it was. And they were looking for it and couldn't find it. According to the report, by the time the flight crosses into New York State, it takes a dramatic turn to the south, putting it directly on course for New York City a prime target in a deadly plot that has been years in the making. The Al-Qaeda network and its affiliates are sophisticated, patient, disciplined, and lethal. It was the perfect marriage. Osama bin Laden, sworn enemy of the United States, leader of Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden had the money and was able to pull something off and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, a terrorist entrepreneur. He was the grand strategic thinker in the terrorism world at that time. Together, they would create a plot so evil, so ingenious, it would prove beyond anyone's wildest imagination. 19 people operating on a plot hatched in the remotest parts of Afghanistan beat every single defense that this country has. And that's a remarkable fact. We never penetrated the 9-11 plot overseas. The deeper they dug, the more remarkable the facts the commission uncovered. Startling new details that came from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed himself, who was captured in Pakistan in 2003. The plot started, Khalid told interrogators, as a much grander plan, a plan he first pitched to bin Laden in 1996. The original plot that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had uh, put together was to have as many as 10 or 12 aircraft hijacked simultaneously. Some would blow up over the Pacific Ocean, while others would crash into targets in the United States, such as the FBI, the CIA, and nuclear power plants. He wanted to attack the tallest buildings in the West Coast, as well as on the East Coast. And Khalid was to play a starring role. Khalid wanted himself to hijack one aircraft and uh, land it and read us a grand statement of jihad, then blow the plane up. Evidently, he was told by bin Laden, that's too ambitious. You really can't pull that off. That's too much. Cut it down. So bin Laden and Khalid scaled back, concentrating on fewer, more strategic and symbolic targets inside the United States. The U.S. Capitol, the Pentagon, the World Trade Center, and bin Laden's personal favorite. Osama was seemingly obsessed with hitting the White House as the first and foremost of all targets. The flights that were headed to Washington 
uh, had the White House first and then Congress and then the Pentagon as their targets. The commissioners were surprised to learn just how much input bin Laden had. We think that he selected most of the hijackers personally and that he is clearly the, the key figure. He chose the men from a pool of elite jihadists, mostly Saudis, who had sworn an oath of allegiance to him. These were not the kind of innocent people that often make up suicide bombers, for instance, in Palestine. These were highly motivated, sophisticated people. They were true believers, true fanatics. And among them, bin Laden found a man with the makings of a true leader, Mohammed Atta. He ran the operation. He was the mastermind, the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts. An Egyptian-born engineer and member of the infamous Hamburg cell in Germany, Atta spoke fluent English, had extensive knowledge of the West, and was fueled by a burning hatred of the United States. He was a very compulsive, very hardworking, and very dedicated man who didn't have, as, we, as far as we could tell, virtually any private life. Atta and his fellow hijackers began intensive training in Afghanistan in 1999. Other recruits followed. It was an indoctrination for small arms, explosives, how to make bombs, how to, you know, do whatever. It was a terrorist camp. Some were taught how to storm the cockpit and disarm air marshals. Others practiced killing animals to prepare for killing people. They don't haphazardly wake up one morning and say, oh, let's go blow up the Washington Monument. It would be a long-term planning session. That planning included training in the very country they sought to destroy. In the summer of 2000, Atta and the other future pilots began flight training school in America. By mid-August, three were licensed to fly small planes. Soon, they were studying how to fly large jets on simulators. Back in Afghanistan, bin Laden was turning up the heat. On at least two occasions, Osama bin Laden pressed the hijackers in America to move the data. On both occasions, uh, Mohammed Atta sent word back, just give us a bit more time. Atta didn't want to leave anything to chance. He wanted to pick the perfect flights. They wanted a Boeing airplane. They wanted to make sure it was filled with fuel so that it would cause the greatest damage. Therefore, they picked transcontinental flights. In the early summer of 2001, Atta and some of his men started taking reconnaissance flights, often on United Airlines, and some in the same 757 and 767 aircraft they would fly on September 11th. Well, the surveillance flights were disciplined. They didn't take many of them, but they took enough until they were sure exactly what the procedures were. They calculated that on almost every flight, about 15 minutes after takeoff, either one of the pilots would come out and open the door, or one of the flight attendants would open the door and bring coffee in. Their training and instructions were, don't try to storm the, the cockpit doors. Wait till they open them. The whole operation, the commission discovered, cost between $400 and $500,000. But contrary to popular belief, the money did not come out of bin Laden's pocket. Everybody viewed him as the financier of Al-Qaeda with a fortune of $300 million or whatever. Turns out that's not true. He, he was cut off by his family. Al-Qaeda was financed at the rate of about 30 million a year by a lot of sympathizers in the Gulf. By April 2001, the muscle hijackers, the ones who would control the passengers, began filtering into Orlando, Miami, Washington, D.C., and New York. Most had tourist visas. Atta continued on course, taking care of details large and small. He was the man who literally would run everybody else to the airport. He was the man who accounted for much of the money. Uh, and he was the man who gave instructions on who would go on what plane. Everything was going smoothly. Atta had just one worry, pilot Ziad Jara. Here's a man who totally was outside the stereotype of the 9-11 hijacker. Had been educated in a Christian school, uh, drank quite a bit, a big fan of beer. Uh, had a girlfriend. 
he's got this girlfriend, he's got the potential for a better, is he going to choose life instead of death? Is he going to walk out on us last minute? He's one of the pilots, so they counted on him. Despite unease about Jara, Atta picked a date, September 11th, when Congress was back in session. Flights were chosen and tickets were purchased between August 25th and September 5th. On September 8th, Jara made his way from his home base in Florida to Newark, leaving a sentimental goodbye letter for the girlfriend who had divided his loyalties. After five years of preparation, the final countdown had begun. They were so sure that they would get all of their people uh, uh, aboard that uh, they felt they didn't need backup people or backup plans, and they were right. And the hijackers were well aware that their plan to turn their airplanes into missiles of destruction was both novel and unexpected. 8.28 a.m., air traffic control in Boston now knows that American Airlines Flight 11 is hijacked. They alert the FAA Command Center in Herndon, Virginia. The center also calls NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, whose military jets are responsible for defending U.S. airspace. NORAD's Northeast Defense Sector, NEADS, is based in Rome, New York. All right, Boston Center Team U, we have uh, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some S-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise, not a test. With that phone call, the FAA and NORAD spring into action. NEADS readies two F-15s from Otis Air Force Base on Cape Cod, which is 153 miles away from New York City. Standard procedure during a hijacking is to surround the hijacked plane and escort it to an airport agreed upon with the hijacker. But this is no normal hijacking. The terrorists have issued no list of demands. And by turning off the transponder, it makes the plane hard to find. NIAD's personnel don't know what to do. We thought if somebody hijacked an airplane, they would use it with hostages. The most important thing is to protect the lives of the passengers. Therefore, just go with them, land the plane, let the hijackers off. Nobody thought you would use an airplane as a weapon, as a missile, and aim it at a big building. One or two people, three or four, may have thought of that, but the system as a whole simply did not imagine that that could happen. And it did. 8.42 a.m., another hijacking is underway. United Airlines Flight 175 from Boston to L.A. The plane is over Pennsylvania when the hijackers turn it toward New York, which is also where Flight 11 is headed. Aboard Flight 11, Betty Ong and Amy Sweeney stay on the phone, giving American Airlines valuable information that will later help piece the events together. They report that the plane is flying dangerously low. What's going on, Betty? The aircraft is erratic again. Betty, talk to me. Betty, are you there? I think we might have lost her. Betty Yong's brother and sister listened as the commission played a tape of their sister's last conversation. To sit there knowing that everybody was going to die, uh, it's, uh, it's a very compelling moment. 8.46 a.m., Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. At the time, no one is aware that America is under attack. The formal declaration of war came in 1998 when Osama bin Laden issued his famous fatwa against the United States, calling for the murder of any American anywhere on Earth. In truth, we had been at war since 1992. We just didn't know it, says Commissioner Jamie Gorelick. The US government really did not understand the nature of the threat until 1997, 1998. Afghanistan, 1980. Armies of Muslim men from around the world, including a young Osama bin Laden, 
flocked to the barren hills to fight the Soviet invasion. Creating, Al-Qaeda expert Rowan Gunaratna told the commission, a breeding ground for terrorism. Throughout the 1990s, Afghanistan became a terrorist Disneyland. The Soviet war ended in 1989. Islamist fury did not. Out of this anger and turmoil, Osama bin Laden and Palestinian cleric Abdullah Azam launched a new jihad. They called it Al-Qaeda, for foundation or base. Al-Qaeda built with the assistance of Taliban, state-of-the-art terrorist training and operational infrastructure in Afghanistan. It was set up like a mini government with intelligence, military, financial, and political committees. There were sophisticated training camps to teach the art of war. Bin Laden even had a special department for media affairs and propaganda. Bin Laden was probably the most media savvy terrorist we've ever witnessed or experienced. He had his own satellite uh, phone, he had his own recording studio, he had his own film editing suite. This guy knew how to put out the stuff. His message reached different terrorist groups throughout the Arab world. Larry Johnson is a former counter-terrorism agent with the CIA. Bin Laden, to his credit and to our peril, has this vision of bringing together these disparate elements that normally are at odds with each other, calling them to cooperate. His rallying cry to rid Saudi Arabia of the U.S. troops allowed in after Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. For bin Laden, the Saudi royal family should never have invited U.S. troops because it was, in his view, infidels trampling on the holy ground, the holy sites. And in bin Laden's interpretation of Islam, it is the duty of every Muslim to murder the infidels. Al-Qaeda made its first attempt to fulfill that duty in 1992 in Aden, Yemen. They bombed a hotel where a U.S. servicemen were staying ready to go to the Somalia operation. Two people were killed, but no Americans. Then came the infamous Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia. Though not widely known, an informant helped the commission trace the militia downing of two helicopters back to Al-Qaeda. What he said was that Osama bin Laden had sent top leaders uh, of its weapons trainers into, into Somalia to provide the Somalis with the weapons used to shoot down the U.S. helicopters and train them and how to use them to accomplish exactly what they did in October 1993. 18 U.S. soldiers died in that battle. But it was just a taste of what was to come. August 7, 1998, a truck loaded with handmade bombs pulled up to the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. It exploded at 10.35 a.m., destroying the embassy, killing over 200 people and injuring 5,000 more. Five minutes later, another powerful truck bomb exploded at the embassy in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. 11 people died. Only two years later, America would be caught off guard again. On October 12, 2000, the United States warship, the Coal, was attacked, and 17 sailors were killed, many more were wounded. Al-Qaeda terrorists piloted a small boat loaded with explosives into the destroyer in the port of Aden in Yemen. In a harbinger of things to come, bin Laden himself chose the target and the suicide operatives. But he wasn't only targeting U.S. interests overseas, he had set his sights on America itself. The Millennium Plot was an effort by bin Laden to carry out multiple attacks against the United States in several places in the world, and at the same time attack LAX and possibly other parts of the United States simultaneously in late December 1999. That plot was thwarted when officials caught Ahmed Ressam, a terrorist linked to bin Laden, crossing the border from Vancouver to Seattle with a trunk full of plastic explosives. What they did not know was that four of his fellow jihadists were already inside our borders, being taught how to pilot airplanes. 
An enemy was within United States borders. An enemy very much underestimated for years by U.S. intelligence. Going straight into the building. 8.46 a.m. Flight 11 has crashed into the World Trade Center. Al-Qaeda terrorists have hijacked Flight 175. And now there is a third hijacking. This one is Flight 77 from Washington, D.C., also headed for Los Angeles. All three hijackings follow the same pattern with the murder of the co-pilot and pilot. The captain of Flight 77 was Charles Burlingame. He would never, ever, ever have entrusted a stranger with that airplane when he had lives at stake. For them to take the pilots out of the cockpit, they would have had to eliminate them. Meanwhile, the fourth targeted plane, United Flight 93, is taking off from Newark with 37 passengers, including four hijackers. It is bound for San Francisco, but its ultimate objective is Washington, D.C., the White House. Boys and girls, sound this word out. Get ready. President Bush is visiting a school in Sarasota, Florida. Just before he goes into a second grade classroom, advisors inform him a plane has struck the World Trade Center. At this point, they think it's an accident. Airline officials don't yet know that they are dealing with more than one hijacking. Neither does the military. Seven minutes after Flight 11 crashes into the World Trade Center, two NIAD's military jets are in the air in search of the ill-fated flight. By now, air traffic control in New York notices there is a problem with Flight 175 and fears they have a second hijacking on their hands they alert the FAA. We have several situations going on here. It's uh, escalating big, big time. And we need to get the military involved with us. We're, we're involved with something else. We have other aircraft that may have a similar situation going on here. And in Boston, a closer analysis of Mohammed Atta's last words as he took control of Flight 11 appears to confirm this shocking conclusion. What did we confirm with, uh, with downstairs? But the analysis comes too late. 9.03 a.m. Flight 175 barrels into the south tower of the World Trade Center. The question now is how many other hijacked planes are involved in this devastating plot? That would be the first of many questions. As the months passed, the nation demanded answers, and the commission was charged with finding them. The events of 9-11 were a great tragedy for the nation, taking the lives of nearly 3,000 innocent civilians and forever changing the lives, of course, of those who they left behind. For about a year and a half, they probed and questioned. The real business of this commission is to learn the lessons and to find the ways to fix those dysfunctions. This was a failure of policy, management, capability, and above all, a failure of imagination. Your government failed you. Those entrusted with protecting you failed you. And I failed you. It was one of the most dramatic moments of the 9-11 Commission. We tried hard, but that doesn't matter because we failed. Richard Clark, a high-ranking intelligence official under four presidents, apologizing to the families of the dead. I think it's courageous, and I would have hoped that other people would have apologized. It helps the grieving process because you have people that were in jobs who were responsible to protect our nation that clearly failed. The commission followed the trail of failures back to the Clinton administration. I think our biggest number one failing 
was allowing those training camps in Afghanistan to start up in 96 and continue unabated. I repeatedly suggested during the Clinton administration that rather than wait for the next terrorist attack, we should just go out and bomb the terrorist camps in Afghanistan. Why should there be camps in Afghanistan training people to attack Americans? But, says Clark, the Pentagon didn't want to take the chance. For years, every time we asked the Pentagon to go after a terrorist, to stage a military operation, they came up with a thousand reasons why they couldn't do it. It would be risky. We would run the risk of having another Black Hawk Down incident with people killed. We would need thousands of troops to do it. But after the bombings of two U.S. embassies in Africa, America finally fought back. Sandy Berger, the national security advisor at the time, told the commission that President Clinton meant business. There could not have been any doubt about what President Clinton's intent was after he fired 60 Tomahawk cruise missiles at bin Laden in August 98. The intent was to kill bin Laden. But the cruise missiles, launched miles away from the Arabian Sea, missed him. The response of 42 cruise missiles, and that's the response, is, well, that's not much. I'm personally frustrated. I've been very critical of the Clinton administration. I took your phone call on the 19th of, of August in 1998 to inform me as vice chairman of the Intelligence Committee that we were going to attack Afghanistan. And I told you then that I hoped that it was big enough that they knew that the United States and America had done it. President Clinton wanted to launch more attacks, Clark told the commission, but ran up against a bizarre political twist back home. After we bombed the Al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan, the media, the Congress, said, oh, this is the Clinton administration doing wag the dog, trying to divert attention from Monica Lewinsky by pretending there's a big Al-Qaeda threat and you have to go bomb it. The CIA and the military did continue to track bin Laden, mostly by using Afghan locals and the state-of-the-art spy plane, the Predator. There were three opportunities at which Predator video, that is video mounted on a Predator type of surveillance aircraft that's non-manned, actually identified in his crosshairs pictures of bin Laden and could have taken him out at any one of those times. But each time, fear of bad intelligence or collateral damage, killing innocent people, got in the way. What the policymakers complained about is the lack of actionable intelligence. In other words, they did not have intelligence of sufficient uh, validity uh, that they could say, OK, we're going to strike with military force. I mean, understand that while we were sitting there in 1998 uh, worried about pulling the trigger and we were concerned there might be collateral damage, uh, for him, collateral damage is the objective. He was trying to figure out a way to kill hundreds of thousands of us, not hundreds of thousands of people wearing uniforms, but hundreds of thousands of Americans, period. Their best chance to kill bin Laden occurred in 1999, when the CIA located him at a camp in Afghanistan. Cruise missiles were poised and ready to strike. But the attack was aborted at the last minute when an official aircraft of the United Arab Emirates was sighted nearby, the policymakers not wanting to chance killing an emirate prince. America continued missing opportunities, and bin Laden continued planning his next deadly attack. When in 2000 he struck again, this time the USS Cole in the port of Aden, Yemen, the U.S. did not retaliate. The coal actually is the best example of how we made mistakes. We treated the coal as a one-off incident. We waited until we had absolute proof that bin Laden was behind the coal. It was ridiculous to do that. Yeah, we should have treated the coal as an act of war. The USS Cole happened in October, right during a presidential campaign in the year 2000. President Clinton had a few weeks remaining and he decided not to retaliate. President Bush comes into office. He decides not to retaliate. He wants to take a more strategic posture in reaction. We really thought that the coal um, incident was 
uh, was passed that you didn't want to respond uh, tit for tat. You bomb a USS warship in port and nearly sink it, and the response is nothing. It was very frustrating, not only me as a uh, FBI agent, but me as an American citizen, you know, I mean, to let this thing go unchecked, basically. America would pay a heavy price. That became painfully obvious on 9-11. By 9.03 a.m., the federal government knew that two planes had crashed into the World Trade Center, and the worst terrorist attack on America was well underway. With thousands of planes in the air, some possibly hijacked, the FAA and air defense were put to the test, a test they ultimately failed. Nine oh five a.m. Two planes have now crashed. Sixty on page one fifty. In Florida, White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card informs the president that a second plane has struck the World Trade Center, and America is under attack. The, count of three, everyone should be on page 153. the president continues listening to the children read for another five to seven minutes. He explains to the commission his instinct was to project calm. It's a controversial decision, particularly to the families of some of the victims. It was inconceivable to me. I was like, well, what exactly was the president doing there even after the first plane? Unacceptable. Why was the president allowed to sit there for as long as he was? Who was leading this country? Vice President Dick Cheney is in the White House when he learns from an assistant about the first plane hitting the World Trade Center. Cheney is watching television when the second plane strikes. He speaks to the president by phone about the brief statement President Bush will make before leaving for the airport. I've ordered that the full resources of the federal government uh, go to help the victims and their families and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. Meanwhile, American Airlines Flight 77 is missing. The plane is over West Virginia and begins turning south when the Indianapolis controller tracking the flight notices it disappear from his radar screen. He knows nothing about the hijacking of Flight 11 and 175, so he fears Flight 77 has crashed. They called up uh, the state troopers, they called up the local Air Force base, and they basically were going to start a, um, a search for wreckage. According to the commission, because of this confusion, along with a radar glitch, Air traffic control never sees Flight 77 turn around. For the next 36 minutes, it will travel undetected directly toward Washington, D.C. During this time when something could be done, the commission reveals, federal agencies respond ineffectually. One of the most dispiriting stories is the story of the lack of communication between the Federal Aviation Administration and NORAD, which is responsible for protecting the airspace over the United States. We were essentially defenseless as a nation that morning. You really have to wonder why NORAD had not planned for this scenario. They certainly had the resources uh, that were available for it. Uh, they were certainly aware of the possibility that they might have to shoot down a civilian airplane. And I don't think that they would have had to have done very much in order to have at least a playbook available rather than trying to have to invent it on the spot. Despite knowing that two hijacked airliners have been turned into missiles, the FAA never issues a warning to other airplanes to lock their cockpits. And a failure of communication between the FAA and the military also contributes to the confusion on what flights were missing and when. NIADS gets this report from the FAA more than a half hour after Flight 11 has already crashed 
into the World Trade Center. Just had a report that American 11 is still in the air and it's on its way towards heading towards Washington. Okay, American 11 is still in the air? Yes, on its way towards there was Washington? Another, there was definitely another aircraft that hit the tower. That's the latest report we have. Okay. I'm going to try to confirm an ID for you, but I would assume he's somewhere over uh, either New Jersey or somewhere further south. Okay, so American 11 isn't a hijack at all then, right? No, he is a hijack. He, American 11 is a hijack? Yes. And this he's going into Washington? This could be a third aircraft. Okay, uh, American Airlines is still airborne. 11, the first guy, he's heading towards Washington. Okay, I think we need to scramble Langley right now, and I'm going I'm to take the fighters from Otis and try to chase this guy down if I can find him. The commission faulted NORAD for being unprepared. NORAD was set up at the height of the Cold War to protect the U.S. from a Soviet attack. Their pilots were trained to look outward for foreign enemies. The fact of the matter is that we expected any threat to the United States to come at us from abroad, that it would come over the oceans. And we simply, NORAD included, was not, they were not directed to the interior of the United States. Making matters worse, since the end of the Cold War, NORAD's facilities had been slashed. In the 1950s, it had 26 bases from which to scramble jets in case of an enemy attack. On September 11th, there were only seven. Back during the Eisenhower administration, or even when uh, President Bush was uh, in the Air National Guard, uh, there were thousands of fighter planes that were on hair trigger alert. There were dozens and dozens of radar stations tracking things all over the country. And if we had had a situation like we had with 9-11 back when NORAD was in its prime, uh, I think that they would have uh, been on it like a duck on a gin bug. They would have been very alert to what was going on, very quick to respond. But on 9-11, with three hijacked planes and one more to come, NORAD and the FAA were no match for the unconventional plot that was unfolding. 9.30 a.m. Two jets take off from Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, ordered toward Baltimore. Their mission is to intercept the hijacked Flight 11 and prevent it from reaching Washington. Of course, Flight 11 has already crashed. NORAD doesn't even know that a third hijacked plane, Flight 77, is fast approaching the nation's capital from the west. It takes until 9.34 for the FAA to finally inform NORAD that another plane is lost. Then, just two minutes later, air traffic control at Dulles International Airport in Washington finds the plane on radar. It is closing in fast. They immediately alert the Secret Service that a plane is headed for the White House. The Langley fighters are ordered to get to D.C. as soon as possible. Afraid that a crash is imminent, the Secret Service orders Vice President Cheney to a secure underground bunker. But the planes called upon to protect the White House are 150 miles away over the ocean. The mission crew commander orders them to Washington immediately. In its report, the commission wonders why the F-16s went out toward the ocean when they were originally instructed to go to Baltimore. The Langley pilots told the commission they were never told they were pursuing hijacked planes. They thought they were pursuing the Russians and expected missiles coming in over the sea. Meanwhile, Flight 77 is circling over Washington, looking for the White House. The building is not easy to find. The plane takes aim at a more conspicuous target. Nine thirty-seven a.m. Flight 77 crashes into the Pentagon, killing everyone on board and inflicting grave casualties on the ground. According to the report, it's not just the failings of the FAA and NORAD that contribute to the tragedy. The CIA and the FBI also bear responsibility. Mistakes on their part allowed two of the hijackers aboard Flight 77 to carry out their mission. Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midar 
were known terrorists trailed by the CIA and the FBI for years. The commission says the failure to apprehend them is one of the greatest missed opportunities to foil the plot leading up to 9-11. Our government did not watch list future hijackers Hosmi and Midhoff before they arrived in the United States or take adequate steps to find them once they were here. January 2000, top Al-Qaeda members met in Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. The purpose, to talk about the September 11th plot. Two of the terrorists attending were Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midhar, both seasoned Al-Qaeda soldiers linked to the American embassy bombings in Africa. If I had to pick one missed opportunity, it would be the failure of the CIA and the FBI to communicate about the meeting in Kuala Lumpur. What happened in the Malaysian capital is like a spy novel gone bad. The CIA tracked the two men 24 hours a day. But when the two flew to Thailand, the CIA was too slow in alerting Thai officials. Hazmi and Minar soon disappeared into the crowded streets of Bangkok. What happened was that when the targets uh, departed Kuala Lumpur and went to Bangkok, that the, the advisory information, the alert to the people downrange in Bangkok did not arrive in time to put coverage uh, upon the targets upon arrival. Got there late. To me, that's like a sheriff in a local town finding some people on the border of Indiana that are suspected murderers, letting them go across the border in Michigan and not alerting anybody that they're on their way. Several weeks later, the CIA found out the two had departed for Los Angeles. But again, they were slow in alerting customs officials and the FBI. And most importantly, the CIA didn't put them on the State Department's tip-off list for wanted terrorists. We made mistakes. Our failure to watch list Hazmi and Midhar in a timely manner, or the FBI's inability to find them in the narrow window at the time afforded them showed systemic weaknesses in the lack of redundancy. The commission also learned the CIA and FBI failed to cooperate in tracking down Hazmi and Midhar even after the agencies learned the two terrorists were in the United States. The FBI asked the CIA for information on two of the hijackers in terms of their addresses. And the CIA responds, we're not allowed to tell you. And one of the FBI agents said, someday one person, someday somebody is going to pay a big price for this and a lot of people are going to die. And that unfortunately came to fruition. What could you have done? Some of that the commission asked Richard Clark what he would have done had he known about Hazmi and Midhar. I would like to think that I would have released, or would have had the FBI release, uh, a press release with their names, with their descriptions, held a press conference, tried to get their names and pictures on the front page of every paper. America's Most Wanted, the Evening News, uh, and caused a successful nationwide manhunt for those two, two of the 19 hijackers. It doesn't happen. On September 11th, Hazmi and Mithar are two of the hijackers on American Airlines Flight 77, the plane that crashes into the Pentagon. Meanwhile, passengers on Flight 93 learn from cell phone conversations with loved ones that they're on a suicide mission, and they're headed for the nation's capital. The hijackers have picked their flights with care. All were scheduled to leave between 7.45 and 8.10. That way, all four planes would strike before America literally knew what hit it. Flight 93 is supposed to take off at 8 a.m., but is delayed because of Newark Airport's heavy morning traffic. It's a delay that saves hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. And if they'd taken off on time, uh, the passengers would, have, would not have known about the World Trade Center uh, bombing. According to the report, that delay also nearly prevents the fourth hijacking. While the FAA never broadcasts an alarm about the crashes, a United Airlines dispatcher does. The commission learns that at 924, 
he warns 16 transcontinental flights to be on alert, and one of them is Flight 93. 9.26 a.m., Flight 93's pilot gets the message and asks for clarification. But it's too late. At 9.28, with the cockpit door still unlocked, the hijackers attack. As with the other takeovers, it is swift and efficient. Like on the other hijacked planes, passengers and flight attendants huddle in the back of the coach section, calling loved ones. I asked if he was okay, and he said no. He said, I'm on the airplane. It's been hijacked. They've already knifed a guy, and they're telling us there's a bomb on board. Please call the authorities. And he hung up. One passenger uses an air phone to call United Airlines. GTE air phone, Mrs. Jefferson speaking. How can I help you? He told me three people had taken over the plane, and there were two people lying on the floor in first class. He couldn't tell if they were dead or alive, but they were hurt. From their families, the passengers learn about the other hijacked planes that have crashed into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. They now realize this is a suicide mission, destined to destroy another landmark and kill everyone on board. The plane is over Ohio when it makes a dramatic U-turn and starts heading east. At that point, the plane started to fly erratic. He raised his voice slightly and said, we're going down, we're going down. No, wait, we're coming back up. We're turning around, we're headed north. At this point, I don't know where we're going. Meanwhile, President Bush is in the air after having been forced to take flight by the Secret Service, circling the skies in Air Force One with no particular destination. To make matters worse, he is having communication difficulties with the White House. When the president told us that the communication system on Air Force One didn't work, <laughs> basically that he lost touch for a while. I mean, to think of whatever national emergency can occur and the presidential aircraft loses communication, I mean, that's scary to me. Effectively, the country was decapitated. They just didn't have that type of technology installed on Air Force One, um, who was in control. Nobody was in control. 10.02 a.m., officials in Cheney's shelter begin receiving reports from the Secret Service of another inbound aircraft, presumably hijacked, heading toward Washington. That aircraft is United 93. Vice President Cheney gives orders to shoot down any plane threatening the Capitol. Cheney later tells the commission that he's acting with the president's blessing. Still, it is not until 1014 that Cheney's orders are relayed to the proper military leaders. According to the commission, it's not clear when the shoot down order is communicated within NORAD. But one thing is clear. NORAD military commanders never pass the orders along to pilots. Apparently the pilots did not understand uh, that they had the authority to shoot down a commercial aircraft. And then there's a very practical, personal thing here. Now, if you're the pilot and you got in your sights a commercial airliner, I don't care what the orders are, it's a pretty awesome thing to blow 100 Americans out of the sky. In any event, because of poor communications and confusing orders, the military jets, according to the report, were in no position to defend the Capitol. It was a vulnerability, the commission concluded, that was the result of a failure to read the telltale warning signs. My view was that this administration didn't either believe me that there was an urgent problem or uh, was unprepared to act as though there were an urgent problem. In searing testimony, Richard Clark accused the Bush White House of ignoring his urgent warnings for the first eight months of the administration. Frankly, I find it outrageous that the president is running for re-election on the grounds that he, he's done such great things about terrorism. He ignored it. He didn't hold a meeting on the subject. And it wasn't as though he wasn't warned. CIA warned him almost every day in his daily intelligence briefings. 
Now let me take it back to the summer of, of 2001. According to the report, the drumbeat began to roll in the spring of 2001. By summer, the threats were getting louder and louder until finally the chatter became deafening. Finally, during the summer of 2001, reacting to a rash of intelligence reports, I personally contacted a dozen of my foreign counterparts. George Sennett tried his heart out to keep the country safer. In the summer of 2001, he was literally going around town, pounding on the table, telling everyone in the government, we have to do something, we're about to be attacked. But the president and national security advisor Condoleezza Rice didn't appreciate the true significance of al-Qaeda's imminent threat. Did you tell the president at any time prior to August 6 of the existence of al-Qaeda cells in the United States? Uh, first, let me just make certain... If you could just answer that well, question, first, because I only have a very I, I limited... I understand, Commissioner, but it's, Did important, you tell it's the president. important that I also address... When you're national security advisor to the president of the United States and 3,000 people are killed, you need to explain what you were doing and why you didn't do anything to mitigate that damage. I want to ask you some questions about the August 6, 2001 PDB. The PDB, Presidential Daily Brief, turned into a controversial smoking gun that was difficult for Rice to explain away. Isn't it a fact, Dr. Rice, that the August 6 PDB warned against possible attacks in this country? And I ask you whether you recall the title of that PDB? I believe the title was Bin Laden Determined to Attack Inside the United States. The memo given to President Bush by the CIA about a month before the attacks clearly warned of a strike on American soil. Rice argued that the threats could not be corroborated and the memo contained no actionable intelligence. It did not warn of attacks inside the United States. It was historical information based on uh, old reporting. There was no new threat information, and it did not, in fact, warn of any coming attacks inside the United States. We heard all this talk. None of it was actionable. Your job as national security advisor and as president and as vice president was to say, it's not actionable, make it actionable. While President Bush and Vice President Cheney testified behind closed doors in the Oval Office, Rice defended the administration on national television. Here, she answers questions about a statement President Bush made, referring to terrorists as flies. You, the, you said the president was tired of swatting flies. Can you tell me one example was where the president swatted a fly when it came to al-Qaeda prior to 9-11? I think what the president was speaking to no, no. was... What, what, what fly had he swatted? Well, the disruptions abroad was what he was really focusing on. When no, the no. CIA would go after Abu Zubaydah, swatted... go after this guy, and... Dr. Rice, we didn't... That was we what only was meant. swatted a fly once on the 20th of August, 1998. We didn't swat any flies afterwards. How the hell could he be tired? We, we the only swatting that we did was when we put cruise missiles in on bin Laden's camps. Other than that, we were giving excuses why we couldn't do anything. And it wasn't an attack on, on Condoleezza Rice. All of them were saying, we couldn't... Prior to 9-11, we couldn't do anything. I reject that argument. Until the horror of that September day unfolded, the government simply couldn't imagine such a devastating attack on American soil. That, the commission concluded, may have been the biggest failure of all. As we say throughout the report, the greatest failure of 9-11 is a failure of imagination by all of us. What also failed that day was the emergency system designed to save lives at ground zero. At 9.45 a.m., rescue workers rush to the Pentagon, where Flight 77 has just crashed. Meanwhile, Flight 93 continues on its path toward another Washington target. And in New York, an unprecedented rescue effort is underway at the World Trade Center. I said to the police commissioner uh, that we're in uncharted territory. We've never gone through anything like this before, and we're just going to have to do the best that we can to keep everybody together keep them focused. Within minutes of the first crash, 
thousands of rescue workers from the fire and police departments and the mayor's office of emergency management converge on the towers, intent on saving lives. They gave us an example of very, very brave men and women in uniform who stand their ground to protect civilians. We got a story of heroism, and we got a story of pride, and we got a story of uh, support that helped get us through. But despite that heroism, the commission concluded that the city of New York was as ill-prepared for 9-11 as the federal government. Much of our response on the day of 9-11 was improvised and ineffective, even as extraordinary individual acts of heroism saved countless lives. While each agency had its own chain of command, the commission found no clear command center among them, no common training, and no reliable communication system. I think that the command and control and communications of this city's public service is a scandal. It's, it's not worthy of, of, of the Boy Scouts, let alone this great city. You make it sound like everything was wrong about September 11th or the way we function. I think it's outrageous that you make a statement like that. My criticism was not directed against the fire chief and the officials that were actually testifying before us. My criticism was against the system that they had to work within, which gave no clear lines of authority as who was in charge. There's nobody that, that has clear uh, line authority and accountability for a crisis of the magnitude that we're going to have to deal with in the years ahead. No one understands the bitter reality of missed opportunities more than the families of those killed. Kristen Breitweiser, one of the galvanizing forces behind the commission, lost her husband, Ron. He was at work on the 94th floor. My husband was in Tower 2. I don't think that he had to lose his life. I think that things were done properly. Um, he very well could have been alive today. The commission learned that a public address announcement in Tower 2 kept many inside the building who might otherwise have escaped. After the first plane, hit the first tower, the public address system in Tower 2 um, made an announcement that their building was secure and to remain at their desks. There were more disturbing stories. After the first plane hit, many fled their offices in Tower 2. Some got all the way to the lobby. Stanley Premnath was one of them. We were about to exit the building to the turnstile. The security guard looks at me and says, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. Why are you going home? So well, I saw fireballs coming down from the sky. I don't know what's happening. The man says, no, your building is safe, it's secured. Go back to your office. Premnath reluctantly went back up to his office on the 81st floor. Minutes later, flight 175 came crashing through the 77th to 85th floors. The plane wing is wedged in my office doorway 20 feet from where I am huddled under the desk. And I'm screaming with everything that I got. Lord, please send somebody. Please, Lord, I don't want to die. His prayer was answered by Brian Clark, who pulled him to safety. I could see his head, and I finally said to him, you must jump. That's the only way out of this, is to go up and over. I said, I can't do it. He said, think about your family. You try, and, I'll, and you better do it. I somehow got underneath him and lifted him up and over, and we fell in a heap on the floor. The next thing I remember, I'm lying on top of this man. I reached down, grabbed him, give him a kiss, and said, you're my guardian angel. And he put his hand around my shoulder and he says, come on, let's go home. But that was more easily said than done. The stairwell turned out to be a maze. The people in the World Trade Center, for instance, when they had fire drills, would go outside their offices and sit there. And uh, then they'd go back in again. They never went in the stairway. So they didn't know that every two or three floors, the stairway in the World Trade Center goes like this and then down. So when it was in the smoke and the darkness, they would hit a wall and they were confused, probably cost some lives. Many of the problems that day could have been solved, the commission said, with better communication. For example, a lot of people were trying to get to the roof, when in fact, the doors to the roof had been locked since the first World Trade Center bombing. And even if they had been open, there was no protocol for rooftop rescues. But nobody knew, including the 911 operators people called for help. Calling 911 on September 11th was a pointless exercise. 
Uh, the 911 operators were clueless. There was an open stairwell from top to bottom in Tower 2. If the 911 operators had that information, they could have told people like my husband, find stairwell A, find it, do it any way you can, and get out of the building. I suspect what was happening was they were so overwhelmed with calls that even the supervisors didn't have the time to impart information. Well, N Number one, a... they, they weren't trained that way. They should have been, but they weren't. And number two, even if that would have been their instinct, they were so overwhelmed that they weren't able to do it. Well, this is an area that we, we, we feel there can be Absolutely. and there should be a solution. While the 911 system had no protocol in place, the commission could find no excuse for the poor radio communication within the fire department. Rescue efforts by the Fire Department of New York were hampered by the inability of its radios to function in buildings as large as the Twin Towers. It's upsetting to me that the firemen were sent into those buildings with faulty radios. Um, that's what my upsetment is, is that not the guys that actually save lives, but the institutional problems that put the rescue workers at risk. For instance, there was no integrated radio system between different agencies. But, says former Mayor Giuliani, that still would not have solved the problem. Part of the problem that you'll face, even when you create an interoperable system, is that if too many people are trying to communicate at the same time in any channel, they will begin to interfere with each other. But at the very top, there's got to be some coordination. Yes, absolutely. The military learned long ago that you have to take a systems approach to communications. You must maintain connectivity. And so we have called for the establishment in major cities, and especially New York, for a signal corps that can deploy with every, every, to every crisis area and ensure that the senior officials like the mayor and the Office of Emergency Management and the police department, the port authority, the fire department, and the National Guard can all communicate with, with one another. It's not a matter of if but rather when the terrorists will strike again, says Lehman. New York has to stop thinking like a city and start thinking like the military. New York has to recognize that they are now on the front lines in a war, and they've got to behave like they're the front lines and recognize it and not be closed to uh, learning the lessons from the past and applying them. Another lesson revealed by the report is how basic flaws within the FBI and the CIA contributed to 9-11. Nine fifty-seven a.m. As frantic rescue efforts continue at the World Trade Center, a desperate passenger revolt aboard Flight 93, now flying over Pennsylvania and headed toward Washington, D.C., is organized. The 37 passengers outnumber the four hijackers nearly 10 to 1 the commission believes the intended fifth hijacker, Mohammed al Qatani, is refused entry to the United States because of Jose Melendez Perez, an alert INS agent in Orlando, Florida. When I realized that Mr. al Qatani didn't have a return ticket, or he didn't have a hotel reservation and didn't speak the English, actually then, you know, I just got worried about what was going on here. It is August 4, 2001, when Qatani is sent back to the Middle East. Agent Melendez Perez is one of the few people singled out by the commission for going out of his way to stop a potential terrorist. At risk to his own career, he insisted that this person, even though he had no proof, but he just did not like the profile and the behavior of this guy and demanded he put in secondary, despite warnings from his colleagues that this was political, this was racial profiling and he would suffer for it. He did it anyway. And as a result, the guy was turned back. When we escorted to the aircraft, he turned around and said to me, uh, I'll be back. Katani's absence is the result of hard work by a lone immigration agent. But all over the country, others working for the government also speak up about suspicious people. And they are also right. Unfortunately, their leads are lost in miscommunication and bureaucracy. If one were to write a, a, a movie about the failures to connect the dots and the lack of sharing and the drop balls and the missed synapses and the failures to communicate prior to 9-11, you couldn't have written a script 
that would have been more comedic than the 9-11 script, except for the tragedy of 3,000 dead. It's unbelievable. In the months just before September 11th, FBI agent Ken Williams saw a pattern at flight schools in Arizona he didn't like and put it in writing. That document is now widely known as the Phoenix Memo. The title itself is UBL, Bin Laden, terrorists and other supporters attending civil aviation university colleges in the state of Arizona, and then proceeds over the next nine pages to detail the number of Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda terrorists in the United States, and the fact that these are terrorists determined to carry out attacks within the United States using the expertise they acquired here. Williams told the commission he sent his memo to two agents in New York assigned to international terrorism and to FBI headquarters in Washington. It got deep sixed in Washington. No one read it. In the end, the way you stop a terrorist attack is you push the envelope. Well, in fact, Ken Williams suggested, let's look at the Middle Eastern students training at American flight academies because he suspected many of them were connected to terrorist groups. When former FBI director Louis Free told the commission the Phoenix memo wasn't that significant, Commissioner Kerry begged to differ. That would have led you to September 11th. And I would respectfully disagree with your assessment of the, of the Williams memo coming out of Phoenix because I think it had gotten into the works at the absolute highest possible level. At the very least, uh, 19 guys wouldn't have got onto these airplanes with room to spare. The commission concluded that even if the Phoenix memo couldn't foil the terrorist plot on its own, pieced together with what agents in Minneapolis were uncovering, it could have all made sense. Our government did not link the arrest of Zakaris Massawi, described as interested in flight training for the purpose of using the airplane as a terrorist act to the heightened indications of attack. Less than a month before September 11th, Zacharias Musawi enrolled in an aviation school in Minnesota. He raised suspicion right away when he said he didn't want to be a pilot. He told instructors he just wanted to learn how to take off in a Boeing 747. Instructors called the FBI. The agent in charge found out Musawi was an Islamic extremist with no explanation for the $32,000 in his bank account. He immediately suspected Musawi of planning to hijack a plane. On August 17th, FBI agents arrested Musawi on a visa violation. But when it came time to get a criminal warrant to do a more thorough search, FBI headquarters in Washington said no. They didn't believe there was sufficient evidence for a criminal case. One of the great misses was our failure to capitalize on the fact that we had Musawi in custody. Within the FBI, the people who had Musawi in their possession, if you will, and who wanted to investigate further, who wanted to see what was in his computer, could not get the help of people senior to them. The FBI field agent who couldn't get his agency to listen reached out to the CIA. And so you had this extraordinary circumstance where the CIA, which had been called by the FBI agents in Minneapolis for help, rocketed the information to the director of central intelligence that an Islamist extremist wanted to learn to fly, when at the same time that information couldn't make it within the FBI to headquarters. That is really striking and chilling. But equally chilling was that the CIA director didn't realize the threat Musawi represented. He never mentioned Musawi to anyone at the White House or within the intelligence community. Given the threat level, given the knowledge about planes as weapons, given the fact of Musawi's arrest, why was it that you didn't put the question of prosecuting Musawi to the side and go after the information which may well have led to unraveling this plot. Commissioner, I want to go back and prepare and look at all of the things that were on the table on the time, and I'd be happy to sit down with the commissioner and walk through everything that was happening at the time. Okay. Two days after the September 11th attacks, it was confirmed that Musawi did spend time at an al-Qaeda training camp in Afghanistan and was linked to bin Laden. It's believed that Musawi was to be a replacement if one of the hijackers backed out. Today, he awaits trial 
accused of being part of the 9-11 plot. Another missed opportunity to uncover the 9-11 plot was right in FBI headquarters. According to the 9-11 Commission, the FBI didn't have a sufficient number of translators proficient in Arabic or other languages useful in counterterrorism investigations. It's very possible that crucial information was missed in the months and weeks leading up to 9-11. No one knows that better than Sabelle Edmonds. Many field agents felt that things were missed in their, in their original uh, translation request. Edmonds, fluent in Turkish and other Middle Eastern languages, was hired to retranslate wiretaps and documents related to Al-Qaeda and the terrorist attacks. Agents in the field asked the translation department to review material translated leading up to 9-11. They were skeptical about the accuracy of the work. In one instance, this agent had, uh, in July and August of 2001, sent certain documents, and uh, this particular agent wanted these to be retranslated. Edmonds kept finding mistakes in the original translation. She told her supervisor of the discrepancies, assuming he'd tell the field agent working the case. Instead, the supervisor reprimanded her and never gave the agent the accurate information. He said, we don't do this here. I already sent the original translator back to this agent, and he said, how would you like it if another translator would do the same thing to you? And I know for the fact that this agent never got the correct translation of this document. According to Edmonds, fighting terrorism wasn't the top priority in her department. Loyalty to the FBI was. She also claimed some of her co-workers didn't speak fluent English or the language they were hired to translate. And worst of all, some were actually sympathetic to the terrorists. I would hear comments such as from certain translators, well, this was about time for them to get a taste of what they have been giving to the rest of the world. And for me, it was how, how could they trust these people and their objectivity with, with these highly important translations. Edmonds was fired in March of 2002 after reporting her allegations to top FBI officials. In the summer of 2004, the FBI admitted she was fired because she spoke up about her concerns. Throughout the intelligence community today, there are su superb people, but they're hemmed around with regulations, with bureaucratic restrictions uh, that just smothers innovation, creativity, entrepreneurial uh, intelligence work. Before the horror of September 11th ends, passengers aboard the fourth hijacked plane, Flight 93, make history for their heroism. Nine fifty-six a.m. The pilot of Flight 93, Ziad Jara, continues attempting to deceive the passengers about the hijackers' intentions. But by now, all the passengers know their impending fate through phone calls to the airlines and loved ones. The passenger revolt begins at 9.57 a.m. The commission knows this because several passengers terminate their calls in order to participate. He asked me to say the Lord's Prayer with him, which I did. And then he went in to ask me if he didn't make it, could I make him a promise and call his wife for him and let her know how much he loved her and his family. And I told him I loved him. And he said, we're going to do something. And he hung up. And he never called back. Armed with boiling water and whatever else they can use as weapons, the passengers try to break into the cockpit. In response, Jara rolls the plane left and right to throw the passengers off balance. He then pitches the nose up and down. There are sounds of crashes and breaking glass. We learned that the hijackers decided to take the plane down. Mm. Uh, they thought they were going to lose control of the plane, and they decided to crash it. Jara asks another hijacker, shall we finish it off? He says, no, not yet. When they all come, we finish it off. A passenger is heard saying, in the cockpit, if we don't, you'll die. 10.01 a.m., Jara says, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. 
He asks again, is that it? I mean, shall we put it down? Yes, put it in and pull it down. With that statement, the hijacker turns the control wheel hard to the right, causing the plane to flip over on its back. With the passengers still fighting, United 93, flying 580 miles an hour, plows into an empty field outside of Shanksville, Pennsylvania, just 20 minutes away from Washington. For the FAA and the military, there is confusion to the very end. I also want to give you a heads up, Washington. Go ahead. United 93, have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. When did he land? Because we he, have confirmation. He, he, did, he did not land. Oh, he's down? Yeah, down. somewhere up northeast of Camp David. Northeast of Camp David. That's the, that's the last report. They don't know exactly where. The commission report confirms that the military was in no position to stop Flight 93 from reaching Washington. If the passengers hadn't done what they did, chances are very, very strong that that would have succeeded in its mission and would have destroyed, or at least crashed into either the Capitol or the White House. The dust finally settles over ground zero, the Pentagon and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The smell of death no longer lingers in the air. There are memorials for those who died September 11th. Claude Michael Gann. Osani Gaba. Charles William Garbarini. For their loved ones, whose task it is to go on living, there are concerts and fundraisers. But what they want more than anything are answers and real change so others will not suffer as they have. That's what they hope the 9-11 Commission accomplishes. If they die and nothing is learned from it and another tragedy occurs like this and more people have to die unnecessarily, it adds insult to the injury. So I think it's a great tribute to them that we've been able to get the truth. I was on the phone with one of the commissioners and he said, you know, Kristen, I still say when I talk with people or I do interviews that it was when you met with me and you showed me Ron's ring and you said, if they can find this in a millions of pounds of rubble, then we can give you some answers. Our call for an independent investigation has nothing to do with politics. This was a, an unusual phenomenon, uh, uh, really unprecedented in a way, uh, where the families of the victims uh, banded together and channeled their grief into making real change. This was the creation of the families, not, uh, not Congress and not the President. Today we present this report. July 22nd, 2004, the 9-11 Commission releases its final report. Their chief recommendation and historic restructuring of the intelligence system. We recommend a national intelligence director. We need unity of effort in the intelligence community. There are other key points, better congressional oversight of intelligence, more emphasis on diplomacy, and a change in the way Homeland Security distributes its money. On this question of the Iraq-Al-Qaeda relationship, when asked about the connection between Iraq and 9-11, the Commission has this to say. Uh, we have found no relationship whatever between Iraq and the attack on 9-11. Uh, that just doesn't exist. The Commission's recommendations immediately become a hot campaign issue in the race for president. Congress holds a special August session to discuss their proposed changes. But this is not a report just for politicians. It's for the American people, those who lived through September 11th, and for generations to come. This is a reference work for history, but also, more importantly, we have to tell the story in a readable, understandable, clear, coherent fashion so that every American citizen can uh, read this story and understand. If God forbid, there is another attack. We must be ready to respond. 
We do believe we are safer today than we were in 9-11, but we are not safe. Put simply, the United States is faced with one of the greatest security challenges in our long history. No one in the United States will ever forget where they were or how they felt on September 11, 2001. On that day, another day in America's history that will surely live in infamy, the nation was crippled by its vulnerabilities, and the people who lived through it will never be the same. History Channel. Tour war was the last time we had him cornered. That was the closest that Bin Laden has come to being killed. With unprecedented access to U.S. Special Forces, the History Channel takes you behind the hunt for public enemy number one. Targeted Osama Bin Laden. Next on the History Channel.